we are welcoming Christina Holloway, um, who is one of our 40, 40 fast and future leaders of surgical services. And Christina, if you could just you know, state your name and your current position in facility. Yeah, I am Christina Holloway. My current position is corporate clinical compliance specialist. I work with uh, ambulatory surgery centers in New Jersey, Florida, and currently in Pennsylvania. Awesome, great. Um, so my first question is, um, there doesn't seem to be a specific pipeline from you know manager to director when you start out in perioperative. Um, in your experience, what kind of training do you recommend? What steps did you take um, to get to where you are today? That is such a great question because I actually skipped over several things in my career path and development. Uh, I went from frontline into uh, an executive position that was over many clinical areas. And while that was really tricky, uh, I think anytime you go into a new position, there's a learning curve. So just being comfortable, knowing that you don't have all of the answers and then taking the time out in your personal life to keep up with market trends and investing time into the education. I transitioned into surgical services because I had experience managing a multitude of clinical areas. And so with that um, past and getting that opportunity, being able to align those um, responsibilities and leadership skills into any area is, a, is an option. You just have to not be scared to take the risk and, and to, to be comfortable with your own skill set to know that you can be successful. But pivoting off of that, did you have a mentor throughout at any point in your career coming up? You know, I had a few. Uh, I was super fortunate to work with uh, CNOs and CEOs across multiple uh, hospitals around the country that truly invested in their people. And I think that's the biggest thing when you're going into leadership. You can know everything there is to know theoretically, and you can be clinically sound. But if you don't know how to manage and support people, and that's an entirely different realm of education and appreciation, then you're, it's hard to be really good at what it is that you're, you're responsible for in these executive positions. Because the majority of what you are doing is assisting and supporting staff. So um, I've worked for the, you know, the, the C-suites that I've worked with um, in multiple different facilities have taught me uh, so much. Um, certain hospitals I've worked were for profit, some were not for profit. And so understanding budgets and working directly with CFOs on understanding how that relates back to patient care. Um, the CNOs that I worked with would do a lot of one-on-ones and assist and support, not just with issues that were going on within my departments, but also to be able to manage and support my personal career development. So um, I've taken um, ownership of that in my positions and been able to do that for my direct reports, not just clinical coordinators and managers, but also frontline staff. I think it's incredibly important for anybody who is in a leadership position to help staff feel and understand that their development is just as much your responsibility as it is theirs and to give them opportunities and options to be able to further that. Great. And have you had the opportunity to mentor anyone yourself? I have. I, I have um, a one of my direct reports in my last position. Uh, she actually, I assist and supported her to take over the director job from the coordinator job. And she has just run with it. We still have a lot of one-to-one -one meetings and connections about different things that she struggles with um, personally within that position and also uh, within the, the constraints of the um, job and regulatory expectations. And then in addition to uh, my position now, I function in an executive position over multiple surgery centers. And so I've been able to work with a lot of the administrators and some of the you know, directors of nursing and that type of thing and do some one-on-one -on -one with them with those same types of strategies. And I'm hoping that no matter where they go or what they do, that they still feel that comfortable reaching out to me. And did you feel like you had to, was there like a transition going from mentee to mentor for you? Uh, you know, I don't even think I realized when it actually happened, but then once I started getting a lot of those calls and emails and everything, it was really flattering <laughs> to know that you've had uh, direct personal relationships and people actually trusted in your, uh, you know, the way that you're able to strategically plan, but also 
and how you relate to people. Uh, it, it's one of those things where you don't, that's not something that's learned. It's something that you continue to develop as a team as well as individually. It's, or, I'm sorry, it's not, it is something that's learned. It's not something that's innate in people. And so having to realign where your expectations are um, when you're taking a new position as an executive uh, and, and understanding that that is a bigger part of your job as opposed to just knowing, you know, the ins and outs and operations of a, yeah. Of, yeah, of a center. In your experience, how much communication is ideal between you and your boss in terms of like your day to day? Um, is there a such thing as too much communication? Obviously, I think there's always not enough communication, <laughs> yeah. but like, what's that kind of perfect area of them knowing what they need to know um, and, and you keeping them up on what's happening? Absolutely. And I think it, it depends on the position and the situation. Uh, I And a type of communication. I round, I, I'm lucky and fortunate enough in my position now where I have a very close uh, relationship with my, um, I, I direct report directly to the COO and she and I work collaboratively in the majority of projects. So I get her ear as much as I need to, um, but we also don't want to overextend that and make, and, and allow somebody that we're reporting to feel like we are not um, able to perform our own job duties and we need consistent support and backup. And so a lot of how we communicate, whether it's um, copying on an email as opposed to directing an email or just including somebody in a, a text as opposed to creating conference calls um, where, yes, I want you to make sure I want to make sure that you know what I'm doing, but I don't necessarily need direct feedback. And then on the flip side of that, when there are things and strategies and different types of um, directions that I am trying to accomplish, making sure that she's on the same page and that she is uh, supporting those uh, options is incredibly important. So in previous positions, I used to do one-on-ones with my uh, direct leader um, once a week. And then in other positions, I wouldn't do that for once every three months. So it really, I think, is it, it depends on how much you're responsible for, as well as what strategies you have happening at the moment. Um, when you're building in a new surface line or when you're trying to um, gain capital uh, that needs a lot of uh, administrative approval, your relationships are obviously going to be much more frequent. But in that, we also, on uh, you know, being in this level, uh, autonomy is very important. So anybody that feels like they need to micromanage may not be the best fit. Right, right. Um, during your career, have you ever found yourself coming into an organization where the policies or the systems were a bit antiquated and you had to have a conversation where we need to phase this out? How do you approach situations like that? Absolutely. Uh, and I think that happens more frequently than not, unfortunately. Uh, my response to that, and I've done this in several situations, is to take ownership of it. And you know, it's easy to say this process is, is, is old and it's not functional any longer. And I'm a huge proponent of coming to an issue with a solution instead of just you know, reiterating the problem. And so in a lot of situations and a lot of organizations, I take ownership of that and realign those policies, write them to make sure that the current regulatory uh, requirements are included. As And with my position now, working within several states, you have different states that have different mandates too. And so as we try to make things consistent across the board, you can only do so much of that when you have multiple, and you know, COVID especially, um, every state has a different mandate and expectation and all of the, the current trends happening in that creates a lot of difficulty. So I think the easiest thing to do is to say, I can take this project and let me forward that on to you, uh, knowing that I am aware of the best references that would make this uh, amenable to not just our state regulatory bodies, but also our executive um, and boards, and hopefully will align well to our employees' needs. Do you have a wish list for 2022? Um, obviously, we all hope that the next year brings continued progress with the pandemic. Yeah. Um, but yeah, well, like, what's your wish list for next year for your um, departments? Uh, I think our biggest challenge right now, if I was going to come up with a wish list, is to regulate staffing. Uh, it's hard for ASCs at this point in time to be able to compete with the larger entities that are able to provide larger uh, sign-on bonuses and uh, financially to be able to keep up. Uh, the 
benefits that we offer for quality of life is great. You know, the no call and the weekends and holidays typically uh, off. But for right now, when there's so much opportunity financially for gain for nurses, and in addition to that, when you have the lack of schooling and bringing in um, the number and quality of nurses to replace the ones that are coming out and retiring, or even just deciding to get out of healthcare because of all the regulations, really hard for the smaller ones to keep up. So my goal, my hope for 2022 is that there is a way that all of the healthcare organizations can figure out options to maintain and support uh, and and to, to have enough need for the patients that are coming through that they get quality uh, staff at a, in a position where the staff is comfortable and they're happy where they are. And speaking of staffing shortages, do you find that people are still interested in getting into nursing or, and are we just at this time where you know, over half of the nurses are over a certain age and it's just kind of the way it is and we have to kind of get out of it. Yeah. Um, what are you observing? What I'm seeing in the, the markets that I'm in is there is a large uh, desire for the public to get into nursing, but the number of positions available within the school are very limited. And a lot of that is because they've lost teachers. So you can't have a million students coming into a program because you don't have the clinical means to be able to support their education. And without having the transition of nurses going from clinical into education, it continues to limit what comes out of those programs. So you have that. Plus, you have the schools that were unable to keep up uh, and coordinate needs during the initial COVID time. So we are behind in that to, to be able to move through the nursing uh, students that should have been ready and able to support the community. Uh, and so I think that it's it's so unbalanced at the moment that hopefully we were, were able to realign this in the next year or two to be able to get back on track. Yeah, I hope so. Hope so. Um, what, in your in your opinion, what type of investments do you think the C-suite can make to make a more efficient or help make a more efficient and profitable OR? Like, what can they do on their end to make make that more of a reality or make that happen? Yeah, I, I think that if we can really direct job duties and expectations, uh, as well as like um, algorithms for um, accountability within that particular part of the organization, that filters down. And it's really it, it, it's really important that you establish those expectations for frontline staff. But I think that anybody in the higher level executive suites are equally responsible for staff to understand what it is that they do, how they support the organization. And I think that gets lost sometimes. Um, people feel like that, you know, once you're in that particular level of the organization, that you kind of have free reign. And that's definitely not the case. But to be able to understand and, and hold everybody to the same level of accountability and responsibility, I think that's gonna that would be very helpful in um, aligning strate strategies and, and within the organization and market. What advice would you have for your younger self if you could talk to her? I would probably high five myself uh, for I, I have taken a lot of risk in my professional development. And lucky for me, it has worked out in so many different capacities. I mean, obviously, there's been a lot of struggle in that. And it's created some um, means for me to to need to take a lot of my time personally to to be um, to further my development so that I am effective and efficient for the people who are reporting to me. Uh, but I would definitely just say, don't worry about taking those risks. You know, you manage and support. Not everything works out the way you want it to, but you have the you know the ability and the control to be able to to move things along with whatever direction seems best. So I think that's great advice for young people. I mean, you know, obviously the, the younger you are, the more you can um, kind of take on those risks. So yeah. I think that's amazing advice. Thank you. Um, and then lastly, what do you consider your superpower? Uh, I think my right now, especially at the moment, um, my ability to be flexible. <laughs> I literally I could be in Philadelphia one day and it's, hey, I need you here in the morning and I'm on the other side of the country or I'm over there. And while that doesn't work out well for a lot of people, uh, you know, that, you know, maybe I had plans with, um, 
for me and and making sure that I am accountable to the people who report to me. Uh, that flexibility and adaptability, I feel like, is incredibly important. And I think that uh, being in a leadership position, you you lose that a lot. So, um, yeah, I, I love the fact that my I have suitcases in, in different states of unpacking <laughs> just in case. I don't know where I have to be tomorrow, but if I have to be there, people know that I will be there. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you, Christina, um, I really appreciate your time and it was just amazing talking with you. I love I love talking with the managers and directors and, and getting that 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 varied experience. So yeah. thank it's you. Really, I appreciate your time and this has been amazing and wonderful. And thank you very much for, for taking the time to speak with me as well.